From Madison Square Garden in New York City, ABC News presents an address by the President of the United States. President Kennedy will speak in support of his health program for the aged through Social Security. He will address the Golden Ring Council of Senior Citizens holding a mass meeting called a rally of three generations, grandparents, parents, and children, here at Madison Square Garden. Next Sunday at this time, ABC News will present a special program on issues and answers with top spokesmen supporting the three major alternatives to the administration bill. Guests will be Senators Jacob Javits of New York and John Tower of Texas and Representative Frank Bow of Ohio. This overflow audience at the Garden today, the President will be escorted in just a moment to the speaker's stand by Mayor Robert Wagner of New York City, Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare, Abraham Ribicoff, Harry Van Ardsdale, Jr., President of the New York City Central Labor Council, Zalman J. Lichtenstein, Executive Director of the Council of Golden Ring Clubs, and former Congressman Amy J. Ferran, Chairman of the National Council of Senior Citizens. The President is now entering the garden as the crowd applauds. Ruffles and flourishes. The President's address this afternoon climaxes as a series of speeches and an hour-long entertainment program which began three hours ago. There have been various other speakers today. The President will be introduced by Amy J. Ferrand of the National Council of Senior Citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States in the House of Representatives and friend, Amy Ferrand, Mr. Meany, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow Americans. I am very proud to be here today at one of over 33 meetings which are being held across the United States. And it is a source of regret to me that the head of the most significant organization here today, Mr. Hell, age 77, working on this meeting at a heart attack, was taken to the hospital. I think we should pass this legislation as soon as possible. I come to New York because uh, I believe the effort in which we're engaged is worth the time and effort of all of us. I come from Boston, Massachusetts, near Faneuil Hall, where for a whole uh, period of years, meetings were held by interested citizens in order to lay the groundwork for American independence. And while there may be some who say that the business of government 
is so important that it should be confined to those who govern. In this free society of ours, the consent and, may I say, the support of the citizens of this country is essential. If this or any other piece of progressive legislation is going to be passed, make no mistake about it. Make no mistake about it. Now, why are we here? What is the issue which divides and arouses so much concern? I will take a uh, case which may be typical, a family which may be found in any part of the United States. The husband has worked hard for his life, and he is retired. He might have been a clerk or a salesman or on the road or worked in a factory, stores or whatever. He's always wanted to pay his own way. He does not ask anyone to care for him. He wants to care for himself. He has raised his own family. He has educated them. His children are now on their own. He and his wife are drawing Social Security. It may run $75, $100, 125 in the higher brackets. Let's say it's 100 And he has a pension from where he worked, the results of years of effort. Now, therefore, his basic needs are taken care of. He owns his house. He has $2,500 or $3,000 in the bank. And then his wife gets sick. And we're all going to be in a hospital, nine out of 10 of us, before we finally pass away, and particularly when we're over 65. Now she is sick, not just for a week, but for a long time. First goes the $2,500. That's gone. Next, he mortgages his house, even though he may have some difficulty making the payments out of his Social Security. Then he goes to his children, who themselves are heavily burdened because they're paying for their house, and they're paying for their sicknesses, and they want to educate their children. Then their savings begin to go. This is not a rare case. I talked to a member of the Congress from my own state a week ago who told me he was going to send his daughter away to school, but because his father had been sick for two years, he could not do it. And Congressman, I pay $22,500 a year. And that's more than most people get. So therefore now, what is he going to do? His savings are gone, his children's savings, they're contributing, though they have responsibilities of their own, and he finally goes in and signs a petition saying he's broke and needs assistance. Now, what do we say? We say that during his working years, he will contribute to Social Security as he has in the case of his retirement, 12 or $13 a month. When he becomes ill or she becomes ill over a long period of time, he first pays $90 so that people will not abuse him. But then let's say he has a bill of $1,500. This bill is not that we're talking about Mr. Anderson's bill and Mr. King solve everything. But let's say it's $1,500 of which $1,000 are hospital bills. This bill will pay that $1,000 in hospital bill. And then I believe that he and the effort he makes in his family can meet his other responsibilities. Now, that does not seem such an extraordinary piece of legislation 25 years after Franklin Roosevelt passed the Social Security Act. Well, let's hear what some people say. First, we read that the AMA is against it, and they're entitled to be against it. Though I do question how many of those who speak so violently about it have read it? But they are against it, and they're entitled to be against it if they wish. In the first place, there isn't one person here who isn't indebted to the doctors of this country. Children are not born on an eight-hour day. All of us have been the beneficiary of their health. This is not a campaign against doctors because doctors have joined with us. This is a campaign to help people meet their responsibilities. Mm -hmm. 
There are doctors in New Jersey who say they will not treat any patient who receives it. Of course they will. They are engaged in an effort to stop the bill. It is as if, as if I took out somebody's appendix. The point of the matter is that the AMA is doing very well in its efforts to stop this bill, and the doctors of New Jersey and every other state may be opposed to it, but I know that not a single doctor, if this bill is passed, is going to refuse to treat any patient. No one would become a doctor just as a business enterprise. It's a long, laborious discipline. We need more of them. We want their help, and gradually we're getting it. The problem, however, is more complicated because they do not comprehend what we're trying to do. We do not cover doctor's bills here. We do not affect the freedom of choice. You can go to any doctor you want. The doctor and you work out your arrangements with him. We talk about his hospital bills. And that's an entirely different matter. And I hope that one by one, the doctors of the United States will take the extraordinary step of not merely reading the journals and the publications of the AMA, because I do not recognize the bill when I hear those descriptions, but instead, <laughs> instead to write Secretary Ribicoff, Washington, or to me, and you know where I live, or to Senator Anderson, or to Congressman King, if you are a doctor or opposed to this bill, and get a concise explanation and the bill itself and read it. All these arguments were made against Social Security at the time of Franklin Roosevelt. They're made today. The mail pours in. And at least half of the mail which I receive in the White House and on this issue and others is wholly misinformed. Last week, I got 1,500 letters on a revenue measure, 1,494 opposed and 6-4. And at least half of those letters were completely misinformed about the details of what they wrote. And why is that so? Because there are so many busy men in Washington who write. Some organizations have six, seven, and eight hundred people spreading mail across the country, asking doctors and others to write in and tell your congressman you're opposed to it. The mail pours into the White House, into the Congress and Senator's office. Congressmen and senators feel people are opposed to it. Then they read a Gallup poll which says 75% of the people are in favor of it. And they say, what has happened to my mail? The point of the matter is that this meeting and the others indicates that the people of the United States recognize one by one, thousand by thousand, million by million, that this is a problem which is, whose solution is long overdue. And this year, I believe, or certainly as inevitably as the tide comes in next year, this bill is going to pass. And then other people say, uh, why doesn't the government mind its own business? What is the government's business, is the question. Harry Truman said that 14 million Americans had enough resources so that they could hire people in Washington to protect their interests, and the rest of them depended upon the President of the United States and others. This bill serves the public interest. It, it involves the government because it involves the public welfare. The Constitution of the United States did not make the President or the Congress powerless. It gave them definite responsibilities to advance the general welfare, and that is what we're attempting to do. And then I read that this bill will sap the individual self-reliance of Americans. I can't imagine anything worse or anything better to sap someone's self-reliance than to be sick, alone, broke, or to have saved for a lifetime and put it out in a week, two weeks, a month, two months. I visited twice today, yesterday and once today, a hospital where doctors labor for a long time to visit my father. It isn't easy. It isn't easy. He can pay his bills. 
but otherwise I would be. And I'm not as well off as he is. <laughs> but uh, what happens? What happens to him and to others when they put uh, their life savings in in a short time? <laughs>